Welcome to the Smart Dating Academy podcast. I'm Bella Gandhi, the founder of Smart Dating Academy and your host. I started Smart Dating Academy in 2009 because I had this crazy knack of giving people dating advice that actually worked, that I took. I've been married for almost 25 years, and now my company helps people to date smarter and to find love. This podcast is meant to bring more love into your life, no matter where you are and what you do. And we're here to bring more life into your love. Smart daters, welcome back. I am so excited as always. You know what I say? I'm jumping out of my skin to talk to you and to have this amazing human being on this episode today with me. And she's not only an amazing couples therapist, a professor at Northwestern University, the podcast host of Reimagining Love, and a woman that I consider to be a friend, Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Alexandra, welcome. Hi, Bella. I'm so glad to be here with you. Oh my gosh. So Alexandra and I met, um, if I look back at my notes in 2017, um, through our friend, Dr. Lauren Stryker, and we did an event with Lauren Stryker called dating after 40, make it awesome, not awful. And so, um, that's how we met and we've stayed in touch since then. And Alexandra is amazing in a hundred different ways, but I'm going to show you that instead of telling you that by having you listen to this amazing conversation. So let's just jump right into it, Alexandra. What you wrote a book, and this is when I met you back in 2017, called right. Loving Bravely. Tell us, tell us everything about loving bravely. What does it mean? What do we need to do? Whether we're brand new to dating, whether we are dating, maybe we're in a relationship. Talk, let's talk about loving bravely. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Okay. Well, we will, but I also want to say that I have so appreciated our friendship that now is going on six years and you're right. Like I have such wonderful memories of that event. It was such a blast and so fun to get to meet you by watching you teach this room full of women. I think it was a women only event. Yeah, it was. You're right. And we just, we just had a, it was like one of those just like sweet memories for me. It was such a fun event. And then we have definitely, we've kept in touch um, with each other in lots of different ways over these years. So I'm, I'm so glad to be, you know, to be with you now in this space. Cause I'd be with you in just about any space that we I have. would be with you. And you know what you just, and as usual, I have a squirrel moment where what is Alexander was talking about this event and the sweet memory. I have to tell you something you said always resonated with me. And it's like pushing a button in my head, thinking back to being in that room with you at Northwestern hospital presenting to these women is you were talking about self-talk and you know, kind of how do we talk to ourselves? And you said, you know, at a certain point, if, and I'm paraphrasing what you said, if, you know, you ate, you know, a whole bunch of peanut butter and jelly, you know, or peanut butter on, you know, cookies or whatever it was. And what we say to ourselves is so awful. Like, oh my God, look at your thighs. You look mm -hmm. so horrible. And you stopped and you said, would you ever say that to your best friend? Because your best friend had peanut butter and jelly on top of cookies. Like, wow, God, Hey, thunder thighs. Maybe you should put the peanut butter down. And, and it really struck me. My goodness. We are so mean to ourselves compared to, would you ever say that to your best friend? And that changed my world that day. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, that's the, that's the art of self-compassion, right? The practice of self-compassion, which really actually is a science because that's Dr. Kristen Neff has built her career on studying self-compassion and just what a profound impact self-compassion has on not just our, our own mental health, but also our relational health. It is, you know, I know that some of us are kinder to other people than we are to ourselves, but in general, yeah, Bella's raising her hand. She can treat people more kindly than she treats herself. Uh -huh. 100%. Uh -huh. Well, but I know for me, so I think that probably is true for me too. But the thing I know for sure is if I have had a particularly self-critical day, I am primed to hear my husband as I, I'm primed to hear comments that would be probably coded by other people as neutral. I will hear them as skewing negative because I will assume that his view of me matches my view of me. So I think that's one of the ways that 
you know, when our own self-compassion is compromised, our relationship can kind of spiral downward because we expect from the other person that they're, you know, as hard on us as we are on us, which I think is, I mean, sometimes, you know, I think it is terrible. There are people who are partnered with highly critical, you know, partners for sure. But oftentimes it's that we will project onto somebody else, you know, that view of ourselves, that negative view of self that we have. And listen, we come by that negative self-talk real honestly, which is the heart of relational self-awareness, which is understanding, okay, where does that self-critical, self-doubting, undermining part of me come from? So that's that practice of self-compassion. I know I do it every, every day. I'm like, okay, practicing a little more today, a little more today. I don't know that we're ever done, but I think we can learn to get savvier, you know, about how we're talking to ourselves. Yeah. Would you say that to your best friend? Right. And, yeah. and so self-compassion and the science, as you said, of self-compassion, the, these all I'm guessing are part of how we can love bravely. Let's talk mm-hmm. about this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So loving bravely is the, it was my first book and it is, it's a journey into the self. It's a self-reflective book and it's self-reflection in the service of creating healthy, intimate partnerships. So it's a particular kind of, you know, healing journey that we do to look at our relationship to relationships. And so that, um, you know, I wear, I wear a lot of hats, a lot of different hats in my career as a couples therapist and a professor and an author and da, da, da. But the through line, no matter where I am, no matter what context I'm in, I'm helping people develop relational self-awareness, which is a set of skills and strategies and a mindset that helps us be deeply curious about and compassionate with our own reactivity and relationships, what comes up for us, how we interpret Mm. other people's words, how we behave, just really becoming like students of ourselves, not you know, not as some like sort of esoteric journey, but a student of ourselves in the service of intimacy. So how do we do that? What's our first step to do that? Mm -hmm. So the first, I think the first step is, I mean, one of the really important steps is looking in the rear view mirror, like looking at our family of origin. Oh, huge part of (laughs) family of origin. (laughs) Mama and daddy usually come up in almost every episode. Do you find that too? Really? (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) Yes. But you know that, and listen, I mean, both of us sit here as mamas. So I have zero interest in throwing the mamas and daddies of the world. 100%. You know, because we, we, we parent to the degree of our own awareness and to the extent of our own healing, right? Like I believe that the vast majority of parents are doing the best they can do at the time they're doing it. And, you know, we come up out of childhood with a set of, which is at least a pair of glasses, a particular framing on what we want, need, expect, and fear in intimate partnership. And so we, we need to understand what is our perspective on relationships that we developed based on those early experiences. So the heart, I mean, I think the vast majority of the practices that we do in relational self-awareness work is looking at family of origin dynamics and patterns, not ever to blame our parents, but to understand those early, the impact of those early experiences. And as we're, you know, as dear listeners walking or driving, or maybe on the treadmill running, if, you know, we look at our parents, right, we can, you know, typically say, okay, my dad was blah. My mom was blah, blah, blah. Like, is there a better way for us, a more constructive way to sort of make sense of our family of origin to say, okay, if I stand here today as me and here was my mom, here was my dad, what am I, what have I been doing in my relationships, but what better could I be doing? How do we start? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the one of the practices in in the Loving Bravely book that I love is um, looking at you know each of our attachment figures and sort of um, sorry, looking at the family that we grew up in and sort of like writing down like three things, three aspects, three elements of our family of origin that we really cherished. You know, like what were the qualities of this family system that I grew up in that I really cherished and and valued and that really nourished me well. And then what are three qualities or aspects that didn't serve me well? Like what were the dynamics in my household growing up that didn't serve me well? And I love that because right there 
we're, st- we're, we're reinforcing that mindset of it's not all or nothing. We don't do, you know, black or white. We don't do all or nothing, but we're kind of like teasing apart. Like what were the, what were the gifts, you know, that were offered to me and the ways in which I was nurtured and seen and supported and what were the experiences where I felt, you know, unseen, mistreated, misunderstood, um, and sort of kind of holding on to both of those aspects is a, it's a nice, you know, can be like a gentle entry into like that, that reflective work. I love that. And now let's say we do that and we do that with our parents. Do we include siblings in that or mainly just because we are attached to our siblings, Mm -hmm. but what do you think? Yeah. Well, I love, I mean, I think that we, I think there's a, there's an awful lot that we can learn, you know, a lot, awful lot we learn about intimacy, reciprocity, you know, competition, power from dynamics with our siblings. So for sure, I, my team and I are just about to launch a new quiz on my website, which is all about like the role you played in your family of origin, because I think we do, we get cast into roles, you know, yes, um, different ways. Some of us, you know, especially kind of older, oldest daughters oftentimes are cast into sort of like the perfect role, like the achieving <laughs> Bella raises her hand, you know? Yeah. I raised my hand on that one. Some of us are the easy one, like the one who just like, didn't ask for anything, you know, saw our parents as stressed out, stretched thin. Perhaps we had another sibling that was taking a lot of attention because they had whatever special needs or, you know, just, they were kind of occupying a lot of the space. And so we became the easy one. Um, so there's these different roles that we end up playing and it's, it's, and the role we played growing up, you know, sometimes replicates itself in our intimate partnership. If we grew up as an easy one, it might be really hard for us to say, Hey, wait a minute. I actually don't want to, you know, go away to New York, you know, next weekend, I actually want to stay home or I don't, you know, we, we may be afraid of kind of creating a fuss in our relationship because we've been so accustomed to being easy. So our growing edge then would be to notice, you know, just notice that kind of like pebble in our shoe, you know, the thing that doesn't feel quite right and get courageous enough to say like, okay, wait, let's slow down a minute here. I have a different perspective or I'm not sure this is what I want, you know, but like understanding like sort of where that difficulty comes from um, can be really helpful based on the roles that we played when we were little, you know, what was expected of us when we were little and the parts of us that didn't get a chance to develop when we were younger, because we're never, we're never done. You know, we're never done developing. We get to kind of keep rounding out who we are as people and practicing new ways of being. That's the beautiful part, I think, of intimate relationships as we get to, you know, they can become these classrooms for trying new ways of being, for saying, I don't have to do what I've always done. Right, right. And define growing edge for those who might not be familiar with that term. Yeah. We talk about it a lot and, you know, reimagining love. When I have a guest on the show, I, I ask them, you know, the first question of the show is what is a growing edge that you're currently working on in one of your important relationships? And what has it been teaching you lately? But I love that. I think we're always, it, it re- like that question, like asking an expert that question, like reminds us that you can be an expert and still growing. And it just reinforces the idea that we get to keep learning in our relationships. You know, I know for me, a growing edge right now is around, like, I really feel like I'm in a place of like making peace with the passage of time. You know, we've got our youngest is getting ready to, you know, launch from the nest. And so a lot of, I feel like the grip of my resistance, you know, how much I don't want this change to happen. And I, so my grow, one of my growing edges is like accepting and allowing, you know, the unfolding rather than like resisting and fighting it and trying to insist on things being the way that they were. So it's growing beyond your edge in a topic. Yeah. And just practicing like, what's the new, what is, what is the new, what's the new skill you're trying? What's the new behavior you're working on? What's the shift that you're trying to make inside of, inside of yourself? So yeah, what is the, this thing that you notice doesn't really, it's not working for you anymore. So therefore you're trying to step into a new way of being and expand it. I love that. I love the visual of a growing edge. It's like the edge of where you are now, but you can always continue to grow that and push the edge out. Yeah. And then celebrate when you do. I think so often, you know, I feel like a lot of the time I spend with couples in therapy is one of my, you know, one part of my brain is always looking for, we call it in therapy, the um, AAS, the alternative adaptive sequence. 
So one part of me is always looking for how is this conversation going between these two people in a way that's just even one degree different than it would have or could have gone a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. I'm always looking for like, what is that growing edge? What is that alternative adaptive sequence? How are they doing it a little bit differently? And then I shine the biggest, brightest spotlight on that, you know, because I think so often we miss it. We're so accustomed to seeing the way it's always been. And it can be hard to see what's going differently, what's going a bit better, a bit more peacefully, a bit more smoothly. And so as a therapist, it's easy for me to notice that because I'm not in the conversation. So I will notice it for them. And with practice, you know, they will, they will start to notice it for themselves because that's the heart of change is trying something different. And then the, and then the two of you noticing like, holy shit, like, look at us. Like we did it differently than we would have done it before, you know? And, and if it's one partner, if one partner has changed their part of a troubling dance, it's the other partner saying like, I saw that, like, I saw you do it differently. Like, thank you, you know, like noticing and reflecting it back because that's, because my gosh, making change is hard. Healing work is hard and it's messy and it's oftentimes two steps forward, one step back. And so noticing those moments when things have gone differently and better is so important, which I'm sure is easy for you because you are the eternal optimist. You know, I know how much you are always looking for what's going well and what's good and what's possible. And you have that, that like fierce optimism inside of you. And, you know, and I think we all have some, we can all flip into that negativity bias. Right. And it's that it's what I find is it becomes a choice. I can choose to look at it in that way, or I can choose to say, well, there's a better alternative to this. So you're right. It's more, it is part of, you know, being psychotically optimistic. And I know psychotic can be a triggering word, but we use it in jest to some extent, but it's really looking at, okay, um, what's really possible and what's something good in this situation? Can I find the meaning in this mess, right? Like, is there a bright side? So, so yeah, I, I try to do that. I'm not always great at that, but I certainly, I can feel myself when I feel my own energy shifting where it's kind of like, oh gosh, I just feel this general ugh, right? You feel that blue, kind of sad, kind of that gummy. My mom uses the word gummy. Like, I don't know why I don't feel good. And then you can just take that step back and say, okay, check in with myself. What What's causing this right now? Mm -hmm. Is there another story that I can tell myself at this Mm -hmm. point about Mm -hmm. this? So, um, but back to, back to the inventory that we're taking of our family. So we make our list of people, three things we want or we liked and appreciated in our nurture, three things we didn't. And something that you say, and I know I say as well, we can either repel what we saw at home or we can repeat it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so how does this list help us to think about what kind of a partner is good for us or what makes us happy even before we seek out a partner? Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, so right. So what we're talking about now is like, so as we understand a bit more who we were, who we needed to be in our family of origin, then the next step is to kind of look at how do those patterns come with us, you know? And I think what, what we learn, like the, the way that we develop relational patterns in our family of origin is through two processes. One is observation. We observed the big people in our house growing up. We observed how they handled difference. We observed how they handled emotion. We observed how they handled gender dynamics, right? So we were these little sponges, like kind of soaking up all of the messages, all of the patterns, all the subtle kind of cues about how to do intimate partnership. Even if we grew up with a single parent, we watched how they perhaps dated or how they were in their friendships, how they were with their own parents. We were, you know, our parents are our models for us. And and we learn part of it is by observing and part of it is by relating. The other piece of it is like, how, how are we related to, who did we need to be? That's the family roles we were talking about before. So that's, you know, that's a huge part of the Loving Bravely book is just sort of, you know, there's lots of different pathways into understanding those early family dynamics. And then we start to like fast forward to our current life today and how the Mm -hmm. past travels with us. And sometimes it's, you know, there's, there's three paths. There's the path of repetition, 
which is, you know, I'm repeating the patterns. I was the easy one growing up and now I'm the easy one in my relationships. There's the path of opposition, which is I was the easy one growing up. And so hell no, uh uh-uh, no more of that. You will know everything I want and need the second I want and need it. You know, there's going to like the opposite. And I think sometimes we try, it's when we do that, like path of opposition, it's an attempted solution. It's like, I hated how invisible I felt growing up. And so now no one is going to miss me now. I'm going to be letting you know how I feel at every moment of the way. I have arrived. (laughs) I will not be silent. And I think sometimes, you know, I think one 180 degrees is very rarely the answer, but I think very often that's, we, we get binary, right? It's like, I don't, I know I don't want to be like that. So let me just be the opposite of that. I'll overcorrect 180 degrees the other way. That's we have repetition and opposition and then one more. The path of integration. That's the path that we get on when we are practicing relational self-awareness, right? Is understanding, is holding more nuance. I was, my needs were not met when I was growing up. My parents were stretched thin. My parents were pretty misattuned to me. My parents really didn't understand me. My parents were highly distracted. And that, that doesn't mean that today I'm going to be, I don't have to be in somebody's face all the time. I can attend to me, right? I can nourish myself. I can notice. And from that place, I can ask for what I need. I can listen for feedback. So that path of integration is like the, the sort of middle road, you know, between those kind of extremes of either doing what you saw or doing the opposite of what you saw. I love that. And as people think about dating and their dating patterns, is there, you know, one piece of advice you would give them? Like, you know, really think about this. Mm -hmm. Um, or many things. You're just, yeah, you're yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And, you know, it, and cause dating is hard for people. Right. It's and so it's, hard. it's I, so hard, especially yeah. when we've been choosing toxic relationships yeah. or something like that. So I asked you the question, I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> well, I just, it's making me think I just finished up a really lovely, you know, I, I have um, these two e-courses and when somebody has done an e-course, they have the opportunity to do a, you know, a deeper dive with me, like a relationship consultation, which is like a one-time deeper dive. And so I just finished a beautiful one um, with a, a, a man who is, um, d- who was divorced after 20 years of marriage, beginning to date. And he has taken really two years to do therapy, you know, read Loving Bravely, take my e-course. He's really been in this journey and he is in right now the healthiest relationship that he has been in with somebody who is, you know, she's just beginning her healing journey. And so part of his concern is like, what, how do you navigate, you know, patience with somebody who is perhaps a bit earlier in their healing journey versus accepting like that he's in a place for much deeper intimacy than ever before. But the thing that he is crystal clear on that was just so impressive is he was like, the thing I know for sure is I'm not wasting my time right now. I am learning every day in this relationship. I'm learning about what I will tolerate. I'm learning how to speak up for myself. I'm learning, you know, the the beauty and the pride that comes from being patient. I'm learning to sit with ambiguity. So I think my strongest piece of advice would just be for somebody who's dating to deeply trust that everything is an opportunity for learning. And I don't mean that in like some sort of like airy way, but just truly like dating is a data collection process, right? And it's by it's by getting in the ring and putting your, even just like the little baby toe in the water and then processing, right? Understanding, okay, how did that feel? Like, I think there's so much richness in that kind of growth mindset for somebody yeah. who is dating. So I think that would be my strongest advice is just be gentle with yourself so that you mm. can really view this as a learning experience. That's amazing advice. And you're right. It is a giant, it's like a giant research project, right? And sometimes I see with my clients, if we imagine like we're on a mountain and it's like love mountain, you know, and we're trekking up the mountain. And we're looking forward and we're going, God, I've got so long before I hit the the peak of the mountain. But what we don't do is take a look backward 
and mm-hmm. say, look how far I've come up already. We're always looking in front of us. Look at the ground that you just covered, yeah. right? And keep that in mind. What Alexander's saying is look at everything that's happened to you in a particular relationship, in the dating world, maybe in your marriage. This is all, there are giant learnings in yeah. all of this and it's that. all there. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a, it's a gentle, that's a really gentle um, perspective because I think especially with dating, it's so, at least the world can relate to somebody who's dating as there is only one success and the success is you get your person, you have a relationship, you know, you put a ring on it. Like that's when you have succeeded. And I think that must, I think that must feel awfully invalidating for people who are dating because there are so many successes, you know, the time that you're like, brave enough to have a second date, the time that you're totally. brave enough to, the brave, the time you're brave enough to say, I don't want a second date, the time, you know, whatever, like there's so many. And I know, I think that's what must be so beautiful about working with you is that you and your team are there to notice all the little micro victories that have nothing to do with the ultimate, you know, whether or not you find your person and develop a relationship, but just all of the little things that happen along the way. And I want everybody who's dating to have my friend Kim calls it um, witnessing eyes. I want everyone who's dating to have witnessing eyes, like that person who can be like, holy shit, look at you. That's so, that's so brave. Like that's, I'm so proud of you. I'm so impressed by you, you know, because it's, it's not just about the, the person that you find in the relationship you make. It's also like the stuff along the way. Oh, you just reminded me with that. I, We had a woman years ago, probably one of my first clients, maybe 2012, (laughs) and she came in cute, you know, we, she wanted help with restyling and we did her photos and her profile. And she said to me, I call myself the four date wonder. And I said, Sandy, why are you the four date wonder? She says, I'm great until the fourth date. And then something happens. So we started to unearth that. Now, a lot of what happened was this bad self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like after, like I'm great until date four. And then right after that, like the bottom starts to fall out and why she started behaving not like herself, like, oh, something bad's going to happen, right? And it was much more, the coaching was around just relax and be yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not here to get married. You're just here to get to know this person. It's another meeting, right? And I told her, pretend you're going out to meet your best friend's new boyfriend when you're going out on this fifth date and your goal is to learn these five things. So we just took the stress off. This is your best friend's new boyfriend. And you know (laughs) that you're accepted. You know that he likes you because he's dating your best friend. And she was like, oh my gosh, when she did this and she got the fifth date, you would have thought by my crazy ass excitement (laughs) wanting to pop open champagne for Sandy that she got engaged. She made it to the fifth date. So Uh to your point, it's not always just about getting the rock. It's about somebody saying you can do this. Here's how we're going to do this. And then having somebody witness you and celebrate those little moments. And, you know, and it not everyone wants to get married well, or needs to get right. remarried, mm-hmm. right? People will ask me, and I don't know if they ask you like, well, what's your success rate? How many people get married? I'm like, not everybody wants to get married. Mm-hmm. That comes to us. And to me, when I say find the lid to your pot, that doesn't necessarily mean you've got to go through a 30 minute ceremony in a church or a temple or in a justice of a peace to make this official. It's like your lid to your pot can be anything you imagine it to be. And as long as it works for you and for them, it's all good. Yeah. 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 Right. The lid to your pot might be somebody with whom you get to have an experience you have not ever had before an experience of a new kind of emotional safety. You haven't ever experienced a new kind of sexual intimacy. You haven't experienced like it doesn't, something doesn't have to last forever for it to have just tremendous you know, uh, uh, you know, importance in, in your life. It can be a really important chapter, but I think that's, that's, that's hard to break down because our predominant narrative is like marriage is the, you know, it's the one way it's the only way. And I think especially, you know, for, I know a lot of your clients are sort of, um, dating again, right. Dating again after a divorce. And so I think that that's very often, at least in my experience as well with, um, folks who's, 
that's their journey, they're, they're starting off with almost like this like cloak of shame that somehow they have, you know, they are less than, or they are damaged. And that's, I think we've done just such an awful thing in our culture by saying that marriage is the prize, which means then divorce has to be the proof of, you know, failure. And we just have these like very limited, narrow definitions of what counts as a love story that really does a disservice to all of us. 100%, 100%. Um, well, anything more that you want to tell us about with, you know, loving bravely, kind of how to steal yourself or relational self-awareness before we, before we get into sexual self-awareness? Oh, <laughs> um, I think part of, you know, I think one thing I'm thinking about is when somebody is embarking on a healing journey, you know, they're doing, they're going to read the Loving Bravely book. They're going to do some therapy along, you know, perhaps like along with, I know oftentimes you and I have oftentimes shared, we've shared, you know, clients before where you're doing the dating coaching and I'm doing the therapy and there can be this like really lovely synergy between Amazing. those elements of, of yeah. work. Um, and I think sometimes the... I think sometimes there, it does make sense. Like, I think people have maybe a pause, like they want to pause from dating while they do some healing work. And I completely think people who are coming out of, you know, particularly unhealthy relationships, you know, who are um, not quite ready to step back in. I think that pause can make a lot of sense. And I do always want to remind people that, that, that the arrow goes in both directions, like with relational self-awareness, dating becomes um, a bit, you know, easier, a bit more intuitive. It's easier to know where your boundaries are to advocate for yourself, but also experience with dating continues to grow relational self-awareness. So the arrow goes in both directions. So I think one, one mistake I think people make is this idea that like, I have to be fully, totally ready, done, healed, perfect on the inside in order to date. And that's just the thing is like, we we're never a we're never done, and B it is oftentimes in the experience of dating, in the experience of opening ourselves up to somebody, in the experience of taking the risk of letting ourselves be seen by somebody that we that we tap into another layer of our own healing, right? So that so that the just I don't want people to get into this sort of a perfectionistic mindset that they have to be totally done and totally fine, whatever the hell fine means, in order to be dating. No, it's like when somebody's like, well, how did you know you were ready to be a parent? I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to be a parent right now. And I have an 18 year old <laughs> and a 14 year old. You never know you're right. ready, right? Oh, I knew I was ready. It's like, no, you don't know. <laughs> Do we ever heal? No, we learn how to cope with things that have happened to us. We might have better responses, right? Mm -hmm. And, but that it just becomes part of the unique tapestry that we all are and it becomes part of our story, right? Yeah. And, and that's it. So let me tell you, I mean, there's so many great things I want to ask you and I'm like, ah, which, what, what is the best thing? I mean, talk about, you know, you say, Great sex become begins with sexual self-awareness. And then how does that lead to, how do we feel more confident in the bedroom? Mm -hmm. I mean, sex is obviously a really, really, really huge topic. And when I finished writing Loving Bravely and that book was out in the world, I, uh, my publisher was like, do you, what do you want to write next for us? And I was like, nothing. I'm exhausted. It's like asking a new mom, you know, like when you become, when are you having your next baby? And you're like, never. That's never, hilarious. Never. When are you going to have another baby? Yeah. Um, I'm still dripping breast milk right, right. now. <laughs> Don't ready. talk to me. <laughs> but even, even when that, when loving bravely was just a baby, I knew that I wanted to write a book about sex because it is just, it's an area of such misinformation. It's an area of such vulnerability. You know, I, I, I spend part of my week working with, you know, couples and midlife, well, folks of all ages really in therapy, but the other part of my week is spent at Northwestern, right? Working with emerging adults and talking mm -hmm. about relationships and sex and dating and breakups and all of that with emerging adults. And what's, what's true across the lifespan is that we, we need and deserve more wholehearted education about sex. And so I knew there was that, that book was in me. And so my second book was called Taking Sexy Back. And it's a book about sexual self-awareness, specifically for women and vulva-bodied people, those who've been socialized in the feminine to understand all of the gnarly 
unhelpful messages that have been heaped upon us about our bodies, about our desirability, about what we should want, about what we shouldn't want. And it was, um, it was a really illuminating. I think I learned a lot about myself and my own journey, um, by writing the book and researching the book. But, um, what I know for sure is that we all, all of us need and deserve a deeper understanding of our own relationship with sex, like our sexual self, what I call in the book, our sexy, like our sexual self, this part of us that we've always had and that perhaps needs to have, you know, we need to do a little bit of work with like who we are as a sexual, you know, as a sexual being and who are we in a more unencumbered way versus you know, who our culture has told us we should be, who our parents have told us we should be, who our church or our religious institution has told us we should be, who our ex has told us we should be, you know, that we deserve to kind of cultivate our own sense of what we want and need and deserve, you know, around our sexuality. Mm. So is there anything you would tell us that we should think about as, you know, before we read your book? Mm Mm-hmm. If we're listening and driving, what can we chew on? That's right. What you can chew on is, I mean, I guess I'm thinking specifically about people who are dating, um, you know, and that that's, that especially if it's, you know, if, if there's a woman who's listening, who's in the dating, you know, who's, who's dating, who's exploring this and that I would want her to just feel really authorized to go, you know, to, to relate to sex in the way that she wants to, to go at the pace that she wants to go and to become an advocate for her own, um, just for her own pleasure. So that when she enters a sexual space with somebody that she really, to the degree she can, is ensuring that that she's partnering with somebody who is deeply curious about her pleasure and who is willing to, you know, to center her pleasure and honor and celebrate her pleasure. Because the thing, especially for heterosexual people, the sexual script, the predominant sexual script is highly penetration focused, right? I mean, the word, if you say the word sex, most people think that you're talking automatically about penetrative sex, which first of all, renders invisible the experiences of all queer people who don't have necessarily, you know, penis and vagina sex, obviously. But it also says that that's the most important thing, right? And the thing that the research has shown time and time again is that penetrative sex is not the most orgasm producing sexual behavior for vulva bodied people, that it doesn't, that penetrative sex is there's not enough clitoral stimulation. It's not particularly orgasm producing that women, vulva body people need a lot more clitoral stimulation. So the things that we relegate to foreplay tend to be the things that feel the best. So it's this whole like kind of road to nowhere where everyone is focusing, you know, everyone is focusing on uh, a part of the sexual script that um, doesn't necessarily feel particularly great for women that ends up being like the end all be all that, you know, we haven't had sex until there's been penetration and everything else kind of falls by the wayside. And for men, oftentimes it feels like a ton of pressure, right? If we're, if we're yeah. celebrating, if we're saying that penetration is the most important thing, then we're putting a ton of pressure on men to get and maintain an erection and the entire sexual, you know, experience hangs on whether he can get and main, you know, get and maintain an erection. It's just, it's like a, it's just a lot of pressure. And keep for, going long enough until it can happen. Right. For a woman. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Which if it's not going to happen, if, if penetration isn't what gets her off more of the same thing that isn't working, isn't necessarily going to work anyways, you know? So yeah. I do a lot of, I do a lot of talking about the clitoris. <laughs> I do a lot of showing. I've got the little stuffed clitoris now that I'll take to my, you know, I take it to Northwestern. I take it to different speaking engagements. You sleep with it at night. I sleep with it at night. Right. It's a little clitoris. cuddly. Uh-huh. Yeah. And actually it's right here. I got it out because we were, I was using it the other, yesterday talking about it. It's just like, you know, like this, like many of us haven't even seen a diagram of the clitoris. Like it, it's not, it's omitted from medical textbooks. It wasn't fully diagrammed until 2000. It's just all this like kind of awful, you know, misinformation and inadequate information that we've all been given about sex. And then we wonder why women are like, I don't get what the big deal is about sex. Well, of course you wouldn't get what the big deal is about sex. If you're not having orgasms, you know, reliably, if your partner doesn't know what feels good for you, of course, you're not going to have much desire. It's hard to want something that doesn't really feel very good. Yeah. For example, <laughs> <laughs> that's so well said. So that's my, that's my soapbox on that. I just, you know, I just, there's this information that we all 
need and deserve. And that's, I find that I can be talking to 20 year olds and they need this information and I can talk to 50 year olds. I did a workshop about a year ago with, I don't know, 50 or 60 men at midlife. And I, you know, pulled out this, my stuffed clitoris and my diagram. And they were like, what the hell, what are we looking at here? And they've been married to women for decades and decades. I'm like, this is wrong. This is wow. <laughs> wow. Good for you. You carry that stuffed clitoris around with you forever. I love that. Next time we have lunch, make sure you bring her. I will bring her right. <laughs> She's lavender and purple for those of you who may not be watching this on video right now. Um, right, but if you told Bella, if you told me, if you had told me 20 years ago that this would be my, you know, one of my big talking points, like carrying around a stuffed clitoris, I would have been like, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't want to be that. And I don't, I, but it is necessary. Right. I refuse yeah. to stay like, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's just too important. It's too important. It matters mm -hmm. too much. Um, people deserve to feel better, to feel liberated, to feel, you know, at home in their bodies. And, um, so it's too important. So. Mm, yeah. I love that. I love that. And now let's, let's talk a little bit about, feedback, right? And you've, you talked so many times and I follow you on Instagram and you have so many amazing posts. I mean, your whole account is awesome. And what I love that you've been talking about lately is, you know, people that say we're being direct and I'm brutally honest. And what is the right way to give feedback. Just talk about this because I love everything you say about this. I learned so much from you. Mm, thank you. Yeah. I, I, it's so, you know, it's so wild to be somebody who I started my career long before social media. And, um, and so I'm like, a, I'm an immigrant to social media, right. Versus therapists who are coming up today are natives to social media. They will grow up with this way of, you know, just being in the world, but it's so it's, I love Instagram because it's like a forever laboratory for me. Like I put, you know, I put something out there and it kind of takes off. It takes life of its own. And so I had done this post, as you mentioned, it was something about, you know, brutal honesty and emotional safety cannot coexist in a relationship. And it got so much traction and hundreds and hundreds of comments and really thoughtful debate. And it, it, it ended up leading me into a two-part, um, two-part up two episodes, two-part episode on um, the reimagining love podcast where we really, I really teased apart the idea of like, where is the line between brutal honesty, relational transparency versus people pleasing? Like, how do we discern what goes from our thinking bubble into our speaking bubble? You know, how do we yeah. make those decisions? And it was, it's, I love that part about my career is like just these little, you know, snippets that I can kind of pick up and distill further. But yes, that is, um, I think in some ways it is personality based. There are some personality traits that lead some of us to be more blunt and direct and others of us to be more circumspect and a little softer around the edges. So some of it is kind of like baked into us as personality traits. Some of it is cultural. If you look at different parts of the world, direct communication is highly valued in other parts of the world. You would never say something direct. You would only, you know, hint at it and hope somebody else picks it up. So sometimes when couples come together across cultural difference, you know, it can be like, Oh, wow. Why are you coming at me like that? And for the other person, it's just like, this is how everyone in my family of origin and all of my ancestors spoke. So mm -hmm. I think some of it is that as well. Go ahead. No, I was just going to add an and to what you're saying. And I think as I look at, you know, my own personal family of origin dynamics, my family that I've created with Andy and Jaden and Max, I think sometimes comfort in a relationship can also have a big impact on how we speak to people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes myself included, I think most people, when we feel incredibly safe with somebody and we don't feel the risk of abandonment yeah. or reprisal or consequence that can open up potentially not so great behaviors, right? It's like mm -hmm. so many people say, why do we mistreat those that are closest to us? Right. And right. in a sense, it's because, and I've, I've pulled this apart in my own life. 
Is it, I'm very careful if I talk to X, Y, Z, but if I'm talking to blah, 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 then I feel like I'm more direct or I'm, you know, I can be a sharp knife versus a butter knife. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes down to how safe do I feel with this person? And it's like, you can, and, and you realize why bring the sharp knife to the people that love you most and that are closest to you. So do you, do you think that there's something to that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that there is definitely something to that. And I think sometimes it can be that our intimate partner is our respite, you know, from an otherwise pretty harsh world, but in that, so that's paradoxical, right? The person who matters most gets kind of like our roughest edges, yeah, you know, our edges. roughest edges, our yeah. roughest growing edges. Yeah. So that's kind of like cold comfort to be like, okay, that comment of yours really hurt my feelings, but I guess it's because you love me and you feel safe with me. So that's, you know, really it's cold comfort. So I think that these I think these need to be relational conversations, right? So rather than a couple trying to figure out, are you too blunt or am I too sensitive to yeah. really figure out like just kind of how, how do we repair? Because we aren't always going to get it right. And sometimes our partner does get sort of the sloppiest version of us. Okay. So I said too much, or I didn't say it in the most careful way. Can I apologize and repair, get curious about how it felt for you? And then, you know, try again next time. Right. I think that's, that's probably our best case scenario. And to get curious, like what, you know, why was it? Was it because I'd been harsh to myself all day? So of course I'm gonna be harsh to you. Was it like, what was going on inside of me that led me to be sloppy with you in that way? Yeah. Um, so it's just, there's not, you know, I think there's not right or wrong, um, but that ability to say, ouch, is really important. The ability to say, ouch, and then the ability for the other person to say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry that I hurt your feelings. That's really, really yeah. important because otherwise right. people end up walking on eggshells or feeling pretty deeply unseen. And it's not, and the way we apologize mm -hmm. is also important. Not, I'm sorry you felt that way. That's not an apology. No, mm -mm. no, that's no. not an apology. I'm sorry for what I did. Take accountability, right? Yeah your words hurt somebody. It doesn't mean they're weak. It means your words hurt somebody and say, I'm sorry for that. That was mean. My friend, Terry Real has this really lovely image that he's like, when, when you need to apologize to somebody, imagine it, it's a customer service window. You know, you are, it's a one way, it's a one way situation. Like I, you know, I apologize, you know, like it is, it's not, I apologize, but you did that thing yesterday, which made me do the thing today. No, it's a customer service window. Like your, your partner is coming to you. You have one service you provide. It is the apology in a separate, you know, in a separate conversation, it may be, Hey, I really need us to widen the lens because there is a larger context at play. Yes. You don't like how I, you know, handled this. And it's really important for us to look at, I'm aware that, you know, I've been feeling neglected, devalued, disrespected. It does not justify my behavior at all. And it's a part of a dynamic, but we can't even get to that part until we've apologized and take, taken accountability for, you know, our quote unquote misbehavior. Yeah. Yeah. No, beautiful, beautiful work. Um, I printed something out from your Instagram because I thought this was so lovely and I don't know if you happen to have it in front of you or it's what Alexandra had posted. It says what to say to somebody, let's say you're, let's talk, this is your romantic partner. Okay. For those of you who might be partnered or for those of you who are going to be in a romantic partnership, right? right? Because we know love is going to come to you and you're going to date until you find the right lid to your pot. And now remember, all relationships have conflict, right? And the key is we can look at conflict as a vessel to get us to a better place mm -hmm. in a relationship. And so when you have those moments of, you know, I call them speed bumps, how do we react to those without giving our partner, those paper cuts or knife cuts on the skin. Mm -hmm. And so you have something here that says what to say when you're feeling too upset to keep talking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you want yeah. me to read some of these? And let, if you have them in front of you, because I think they're amazing. I don't have them in front of me because I turned okay. my phone off so we could, so I could have my, I have them here. You. Good. Okay. Let's hear. Them. Okay. What so I'm going to read like I'm going to read Alexandra's work. Mm -hmm. I love us too much to keep talking right now. Mm -hmm. 
How beautiful. And that means, and I'm asking this question, Mm -hmm. that I feel right now like I'm overwhelmed. I'm escalating. And so at the moment where I might be in a rift with Andy and I can feel we're pushing each other's buttons that I can just say, I love you too much to keep talking right now. Let's press pause on this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a really gentle way of saying it, right? Cause it's, you're, you are mm. simultaneously reminding yourself that you love mm. this person, even though you're yeah. so pissed or upset or hurt and you're letting the partner know, I'm not just going to abandon you by walking away. I'm going to say, I love us too mm. much to keep going. And ladies and gentlemen, you can say this to your parents, right? Mom, I love us too much to keep talking right now, right? You can use this with anybody in your life. I can use this with my teenage son at this point. And the next one is I'm worried I'm going to say something I'll regret later. Yep. Right. It's again, it's like just very accountable to the self. It's not you're being, you're being difficult. You're being unreasonable. You're being, you know, ridiculous. Yeah. I don't, I'm worried. I'm going to say something I'm going to regret. I'm right. And all of these are are nice ways to take a pause from an escalating conversation, right? I'm going to need to take a break for a bit. Mm -hmm. Right. And our house, we always say, we imagine ourselves, you know, in a boxing ring. I'm like, remember boxers go back to their corners. Right. And so we all, anybody can press pause or just say deescalate. And we all, we leave each other's physical spaces. Yep. We're not leaving. I'm not quitting you. We're just, let's not say things that we're going to regret or get mean. And in our house, we call it going hard. That's the key. We say, Ooh, you're starting to go hard. Yep. Let's press pause on that. Going hard is words that are ouchy to yep. each other. Yep. Very right. Well said. Very well said. Yep. And they now know when I say you're going hard, back off. It's like it is an incredible. And some of these things can be so easy, but you set up these strategies during peacetime, not wartime. Mm, that's right. Absolutely. Right? have these conversations next time when we get into it and then set these strategies up that Alexandra has, you know, and has given you these beautiful scripts that we've just read out, but put these into conversation. And maybe it's not a romantic partner. Maybe it's your cousin or your mom or your dad or your son or your daughter or your sibling, right? Anybody that you value Mm -hmm. and you know that you, you know, can get into some frictional conversations with, put these and watch how your relationship will grow. Maybe this is your growing edge, dear listener. Yep. 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 It's that's right. Because as as you said, conflict is inevitable. And when we get flooded, we aren't able to keep that kind of bigger, wider relational perspective in mind. We get really kind of self-referential. We focus on how we're being treated unfairly. We're being maligned. We're being misunderstood. um, And we can't, it's hard to listen. It's hard to shift our perspective and try to see it from the other one's perspective. And so those pauses, I think some of, if, if, if we grew up, if you grew up in a home where people did storm out or slam doors or go silent for days, it can be, it can be really confusing, but also really healing to start to implement these kinds of like intentional pauses. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. We've been doing de-escalation for almost a decade. It has made a world of difference Mm -hmm. in our relationships. And then we came up with going hard with the kids, right? Because teenagers, they lack their prefrontal cortex Mm -hmm. or or it's it's their growing edge or it's growing or it's not formed or whatever it is. And they're running around with their emotional brains and they don't realize sometimes, or maybe they do realize that their words hurt. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I say to them, I'm just a human. Mm -hmm. I'm just like you. And my skin is just as tender. Mm -hmm. I love the going hard too, because it's not, you're not saying anything about who they are as a person. You're really talking about their behavior. You are going hard right now. It's not that you are harsh. It's not that you are disrespectful. It's, you know, you're going hard. You're starting to go hard. And that means Mm. that's me. That's a me problem. It's hard on my skin. That's right. We just, it's, I'm like, is that a you problem or is that a me problem? Well, it's kind of both, but I'm going to take accountability and say, this is a me problem. And those words are hitting hard right now. And I don't know. I'm giving you the awareness of saying you're going hard. Is that your intention? Beautiful. And it's usually nobody's intention. That's right. 
right? Because we're, we're all just triggered and overwhelmed. And sometimes we want to be right versus actually valuing the relationship at hand. So the goal isn't necessarily to be right. It's to get to a better place. Yeah, of course. Of so. course. Well said. Dr. Alexander Solomon, you're brilliant. And thank you for sharing your brilliance with the Smart Dating Academy audience. Um, Again, Alexandra Solomon, couples therapist, professor at Northwestern and podcast host of Reimagining Love. Brilliant podcast, um, which I'm a big fan of. So thank you so much for being on my podcast today. You're welcome. It was so fun. So fun to be with you. Thank you so much for having me.